Welcome to Worship with Strawbridge on this fourth Sunday of Advent. My name is Pastor Todd Jordan. I serve as senior pastor here, and I'm just so grateful that you are joining us for worship. And as we do, just wherever you are, I want to invite you to invite the Holy Spirit into your heart, into your mind, into the space where you are worshiping to allow you to give yourself completely over to this moment as we prepare our hearts and our minds to worship God today. From Luke chapter 1, verses 46b through 55. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed for the mighty one has done great things in me and holy is his name his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation he has shown strength with his arm and he has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts he has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly he has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and his descendants forever. Mary mother of Jesus sang out these beautiful words as Jesus grew in her womb. She reminds us that God keeps God's promises. God's love does not fail and God will not forsake us. Today we light the candle of love, remembering that God is love. Let us pray. God of love, help us to humble ourselves so that we might love others as you love us. We see our own shortcomings, and still you see possibilities. You look on us with favor, with love. May your love take root deep in our souls, and may we all do and be motivated by our love for you and your love for all people.
the midst of darkness, God brings a new light. In the midst of confusion and fear, God brings hope and peace. In the midst of strife and stress, God comforts and soothes us. Let us praise God who truly loves us and brings us new life. Now would you pray with me, please? Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the promise of your presence when we're gathered in your name. Lord, may this Christmas season be for us and for those around us a season of healing. May it be a season of hope, peace, joy, and love. In our uncertain world today, we bring before you our concerns. Have mercy on our world and all humankind, God. May they have courage to uphold what they believe to be just and right. During Advent, increase in us the attitude of watchfulness and prayer that we might always be active in service and a witness to your living presence in our lives. We pray for the church universal throughout our world. Give strength and wisdom to church leaders that they may seek your will in all situations, difficult situations. We pray for families, especially through this pandemic. Lord, you came into the world and lived in a human family, so you know the ups and downs of normal family life. We pray for our own families, and especially children as they grow up, that they may learn how to face the difficulties that may come and celebrate the joys of everyday life. Like Joseph, you remind us you are close when our hopes and dreams for the future don't turn out as planned. You are never far away when we face heartache and sorrow. We remember those families this year who are caught in financial difficulties, those who face unemployment and hardship. May they have the constant comfort of the knowledge of your love and care for them. We remember those suffering in mind, body, or spirit. In a moment of silence, we name them now before you, Lord. We remember those who are hurting, and we ask that your tender mercy would reach them and fill their lives with your peace and healing grace. We pray for all those who are sad because of the loss of a loved one, that they would find comfort in their sorrow. Loving God, help us to sense the importance of what happened so long ago when Mary was visited by the angel Gabriel, to remember the words of the angels and the prophets and the teachers of old, and to celebrate all the promises that you have made through them. Help us to take firm hold of the meaning of all these things and to know in the depths of our being that even now you are seeking to work in us and through us as we pray the prayer you taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls, and welcome to Children's Conversation. So excited to be with you on this fourth Sunday in Advent. Did you know when I came in this morning, I found this huge gift. This is like one of the biggest gifts I've ever seen. Do you, do you think we should open our gift this morning? Yep, yeah, I bet you're cheering at me and saying, go for it, Pastor Emily. So let's open our gift this morning and see what we have. All right. Oh, man, it's such a big box. Whoa, it was a big box. Oh, it's a manger. Have you, can you say the word manger? I bet you have seen this symbol of a manger during this Christmas season. And what do we know about a manger? That's right. That's where baby Jesus slept right after he was born. And did you know what I was thinking this morning when I saw the, a manger? I was thinking about how amazing God is and how God continues to do amazing things for us even in crazy times. So it is so amazing that God sent baby Jesus to us in sleeping in a manger. 
So this morning, what I want you to rem- remember, and when you get home, maybe look for your nativity scene or look on your tree and look for a what? A manger. And be reminded that God does amazing things in our lives. Even then, during this crazy time of all that's going on, be reminded that God is good and has a wonderful plan for you and for me and for this world. And what is the amazing thing God did? That's right. He sent baby Jesus to this earth to do wonderful things for us. I hope you guys have an awesome week. Bye. All right, church, you guys know what time it is. It's time to pass that peace of Christ. Bye.
scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, beginning at verse 18. Hear now the good news. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look! The virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had born a son, and he had named him Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief. It was the epic of incredulity. It was a season of light. It was a season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. This, of course, is the famous opening line from Charles Dickens, A Tale of Two Cities, and I think it describes this season of Christmas uh, especially accurately. I mean, here we are, uh, one of the greatest achievements of, of in human history. We have a vaccine in the arms of healthcare workers literally within months of the first outbreak of a pandemic. At the same time, The CDC reports that there are over 300,000 deaths now of Americans from COVID with up to or around 3,000 deaths daily. On the economic front, um, on the one hand, the Dow Jones, the NASDAQ, the S&P, the Russell 2000, all breaking records on Wall Street. At the same time, millions of Americans looking for jobs Food lines are, are longer than, than anyone can remember, and many, many Americans w- worried about homelessness or the possibility of it. At Strawbridge, it's been a similar kind of year. O- on the one hand, we've been able to do uh, amazing ministry this year. Uh, financially, um, we're in fairly good shape because of your generous giving, because of lowered expenditures and a PPP loan that's helping us through. Um, if uh, giving continues the way it is, we may end the, where, end the year uh, very well. Um, at the same time, financial commitments for 2021 have, well, let's just say been less than robust. Um, right now, we are looking at the very real possibility of having to cut next year's budget um, by anywhere from 25 to maybe possibly 40%. It is in many ways a tale of two realities. On the one hand, some amazing things happening. On the other hand, uh, some absolutely horrifying things happening in the world, in the country, perhaps in your family, in life. Now, Typically, I'm a glasses half full kind of guy. If I see things, I'm going to try to see it on the positive side. But that's always dependent on how bad the bad side or how overwhelming the bad side can seem to be. Days like these, it's easy to give in to growing pessimism or skepticism or downright cynicism. Yes, I get that there's always a bright side to any bad situation, but my experience is that more often than not, 
if the bad is bad enough, that's what begins to shape and frame my reality. And in this world of mistrust and disinformation, it's hard to find where we can turn for direction and assurance during this arguably one of the most challenging and complicated years in American history. And during this season of Christmas, where do we look for hope? Well, when we read Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, Matthew would say this. Um, he's saying all this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. If you want to find hope this year, look to an unwed pregnant teenager for she is going to give birth to a child that will change everything. Now, Matthew here is quoting from Isaiah chapter 7. And look, there are over 60 quotes um, or references to the prophet Isaiah that we find in the New Testament. And typically, the, the Jewish Christian listeners or readers of this gospel would have understood what Matthew was pointing to. Uh, for us, maybe it takes a little of explanation. So when 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 um, Matthew is is quoting, he's quoting here uh, from Isaiah chapter seven. He says, "Look, the virgin shall conceive a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God with us." That is taken from Isaiah seven, and we need to know a little bit about uh, our history. So if you'll just bear with me, in the year seven hundred thirty five B.C. The kingdom of, of Israel and Judah were two separate kingdoms. Now, you might recall that King David, um, when, when he ruled over Israel, it was one country. All the, the, the land of the 12 tribes uh, lived in relative peace and harmony with one another. During uh, the reign of David's son Solomon, it was, it was the same case. They were one country. But after Solomon's death, uh, nine of the tribes split off from the north, and they created the country of Israel with Samaria as their capital. And then the tribes in the lower region in Judah, their capital, of course, was Jerusalem. So in the year 735 BC, the kingdom is divided, and the kingdom of the north, and just so you'll know, if you go reading in the Old Testament, the kingdom of the north can be referred to as Israel. It can also be referred to by its capital city, Samaria. It can also be referred to as the, the, land, the, the tribe uh, whose land that Samaria sat in was Ephraim. So in the, new, in the Old Testament, you can read Ephraim, Samaria, or Israel all is the same country. That is the northern kingdom. And in 735 BC, the king of Israel was a king by the name of Pekah. And Pekah, um, he was good friends with Reason, who was the king of Aram. And you'll see Aram just to the northeast of Israel. And at the time, there was a growing superpower, Assyria. Assyria was coming from the northeast, and they were looking to Aram and Israel and even Judah to take over. And Assyria had this very simple policy. If Assyria came to take you over, um, they would leave you alone so long as you paid them their tax. They also might want to move some of your leaders into exile and tell you some, some ways that they wanted you to live. But for the most part, as long as you paid them a pretty heavy fee, um, they would let you live. It's kind of like, you know, someone, basically a, 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 an ancient form of extortion, right? Um, they'll offer you protection, meaning protection from them, um, but you had to pay for it. So Aram and Israel were thinking they didn't want to have to do that. But the other part to Assyria's 
uh, foreign relations policy was if you did not pay them and did not uh, regard them as their, their rulership, uh, they would wipe you out and they were brutal. And the stuff that they would do to the leaders uh, would give you nightmares. I mean, seriously, it was, it was horrific what they would do. So rule by intimidation. So Pika, the king of Israel, and Reason, the king of Aram, get to talking. And they're thinking, you know, the rule of thumb is if you're going to fight Assyria, you better win. Otherwise, it's going to get ugly real fast. So they start thinking, you know, we don't think on our own we can fend off Assyria. But we think if Judah were to join us, we might have a chance. But now God's been warning through the prophets not to take on Assyria. Assyria is going to come do what, what Assyria is going to do, and God's going to let it happen, so don't fight them. But uh, Pekah and Reason, they're not happy with that. So they put pressure on Ahaz. Ahaz is the king of Judah at the time. And they basically say, join us to fight Assyria. And Ahaz says, no, 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 I'm scared of Assyria. I don't want to do it. It sounds like uh, they're going to come in and have their way. So Aram and Israel start putting military pressure. They've got this, the, the kings there have this friend by the name of Tabiel. And they say, if we set him up of king of Judah, he'll do what we want. So they start threatening to attack Ahaz. And so this is where we find King Ahaz, king of Judah. He's in Jerusalem, their capital city, and he is literally in between a rock and a hard place. On the one hand, he's got Assyria breathing down his neck, saying, we're coming in, don't fight us. On the other hand, he's got Aram and Israel, their kings, coming in saying, if you don't join us, we're going to attack you. So what's he supposed to do? So he's anxious, he's scared. Everywhere he looks, it's a lose-lose option. There might be a silver lining somewhere, but he can't see it. He doesn't know what to do. So God sends the prophet Isaiah to Ahaz, and we find this in chapter 7, verses 10 through 16. And the Lord speaks to Ahaz through, through, through uh, Isaiah, saying, Ask the Lord your God, ask a sign of me. In other words, ask me how all this is going to work out. And you can ask me anything you want. And Ahaz is scared in verse 12. He says, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. In other words, what he's saying is, don't tell me. I don't want to know. Because on the one hand, Assyria is going to wipe me out. And if they don't, um, Israel and, and Aram will. And Isaiah gets frustrated with Ahaz living in this fear and anxiety. And he says, Hear then, O house of David. In other words, I'm going to tell you the sign anyway. Uh, is it too little for you to weary mortals that you weary my God also? In other words, your fear and anxiety, it's stressing me out, man. Pull yourself together. He says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. This is the sign that everything's going to be okay. Look, there's a young woman. She's pregnant. She's, she's with child. And she's going to bear a son. And she, and she shall name him Emmanuel. Emmanuel, by the way, is Hebrew for God with us. Isaiah says that he shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse evil and choose the good. Before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. In other words, talking about King Reason of Aram and King Pekah of Israel, by the time this pregnant woman has her boy and that boy is old enough to eat solid food and start learning right from wrong, you're going to be in the clear. Those two countries will no longer be a threat. Now, here's the amazing thing about that prophecy. Remember I said this was all going down in the year 735. History tells us that in the year 732, which would have been about the time that child would be two or three years old, you know, going from milk to solid food, Assyria attacks Israel 
the northern kingdom, meaning the northern kingdom is now engaged in battle with Assyria, they would be unable to put any kind of military pressure whatsoever on the southern kingdom of Judah. Then in the year 722, about that time that that child was going from boyhood to manhood, 12, 13 years old, which for Jewish people was the time where you were officially responsible for what was good and evil, making those decisions, Assyria wipes out completely the country of Israel. And two years later, wipes out the country of Aram. In other words, Everything that God said would happen, happens. Ahaz finds himself, not only he is not attacked by Israel or Aram, they, they are not able to, to, to hurt them at all, but Assyria itself, while they do take the country of Israel, Assyria never takes Judah or Jerusalem. They are spared Assyria's wrath. In other words, God provides a way for King Ahaz in this lose-lose scenario, stuck between a rock between a rock and a hard place. God sees him through. Now, bear in mind, I'm sure there were some moments in the year 735, in the year 734, in the year 733, that Ahaz was feeling the pressure from Assyria and feeling the military pressure from Israel and Aram to give in, to doubt God's word, to second-guess himself. I'm sure it would have been easy to give in to the temptation to try to, to or to give in to fear and try to take in, things into his own hands. But I like to think that in those times of weakness, Ahaz perhaps walking out on his balcony or walking uh, through the city, at some point saw this child, Emmanuel, this baby in his mother's arms and remembered the promise that God had given him. That by the time this baby is eating solid food and making decisions for himself, that everything that Ahaz is worried about will be gone. What Matthew is saying in chapter one of his gospel is that what this baby Emmanuel back in the year 735 was to Ahaz and the people of Jerusalem and Judah, this is what Jesus is for you and me for the world right now for all time. When you and I are backed into a corner of a, uh, uh, being against a rock in a hard place, when it just seems we're surrounded by lose-lose scenarios, when the circumstances seem so bad that there is no more good anyway, where there's a tale of two realities and the bad reality is overwhelmingly opposed to the good reality and seems to be swallowing it up, you and I have a sign that says God will get us through. That's what Christmas is. That however high the odds are that are stacked against us, whatever the circumstances, however imminent and real and horrific they may be, God is bigger. Do not give in to the fear and the anxiety, the stress and the cynicism. But look to Jesus as a sign that God has gotten us through, God will get us through. We have strength and assurance. We have peace and we have comfort. We have direction. We're always able to err on the side of faith in God and trust that we will come out on the other side all the better for it. I don't know what your Christmas is going to be like this year. My guess is it will be not what you had expected it would be 10 months ago. There may be things that you can't do this year that you wanted things that you would like to have bought this year that you can't afford, people that you wanted to spend with or that you wanted to spend with you but can't for one reason or another. I, my Christmas will not be 
what I was expecting. Certainly Christmas Eve won't be. But there will be something that happens this Christmas that happens every Christmas and that no circumstance will ever, ever be able to change. A child will be born for us. A son will be given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And because he has come into the world, God wins. God is with us and will see us through. I believe it was Frederick Beekner who said, because of e Easter, the worst thing is never the last thing. I would say that goes for Christmas as well. Because of Christmas, the worst scenario is never the last scenario. God is with us. And because of that, you and I this Christmas will get the peace that we're looking for. And in that, that's where we find our hope. Praise be to God. Amen.
Thank you so much once again for joining us for worship. And uh, I just pray that whatever your Christmas looks like this year, that um, God provides for you everything uh, that you need and that you're looking for. Um, do want to let you know that uh, the uh, virtual Christmas concert can be found on our YouTube channel. And let me just say, if you didn't see it, you really need to. It is amazing. The level of talent that we have in our church and in our community uh, is truly amazing. You will be blessed if you see it. So if you're, especially if you're finding it hard to get into the Christmas season this year, uh, the Christmas concert will definitely be something that helps you get there. Also, um, our Christmas Eve Eve service at Elm Grove at five o'clock on the 23rd and our Christmas Eve services here at the church, five o'clock outside, seven o'clock and 11 o'clock inside. That RSVP information can be found in our um, newsletter and on Facebook. So take a look for that as you make your plans this season. And be aware that starting on Sunday, December 27th, our worship services will be live streamed. So we're no longer going to pre-record. Uh, when you uh, watch virtually online uh, at 11 o'clock, you will be watching what we're doing here in the sanctuary. So we really will. We've got the technology now to, to all worship together. So that's going to happen on Sunday, the 27th. So uh, looking forward to all the ways that God is going to show up and be born anew um, in your life, in my life, and in the world, and all the ways that you and I are going to go out and share that with the world this year. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. And the church said, Amen.